So if you've been watching this channel for a while, it may have come up a couple of times in the videos you've watched that uh, prior to YouTube and all of this, uh, I was a web developer. I've been doing web development kind of off and on uh, since about 2006. I mean, as far as an actual paying job was concerned anyway. Uh, and when I first got my start, I was using uh, ASP, kind of right at the .NET transition with access databases. Um, and I really liked it because it was easy to see what was going on. Uh, the, the database layout was very human readable. And then when I switched to PHP and MySQL, all of that kind of went away. Of course, there is PHP my admin and that helps, but uh, it's not an intuitive way for a lot of people to interact with databases. So when Basero reached out to me to sponsor some content uh, and I was able to kind of see what Basero does and how their databases work, I was very excited. Um, so that's what we're gonna take a look at today. Uh, as I mentioned, this video is sponsored by Basero, but I am still going to give my honest opinion about uh, everything that we're gonna cover in this video. So if we take a look here at Basero's website, it's basero.io, you can see that they've got an open source, no code database and Airtable alternative. Um, so if you're familiar with Airtable, this may be a good alternative for you if you're trying to get away from that platform. Uh, of course, like it says here, you know, no code platform that grows, uh, very true. We'll actually take a look at some different uh, database examples that they've got, uh, templates, things like that. Uh, very developer friendly, uh, one interface for everything, which I absolutely love. Uh, and of course they've got all kinds of, uh, you know, documentation and integrations with, uh, you know, with post C or Postgres SQL and, uh, and all kinds of stuff that really does make it very uh, versatile in what it can do. Uh, so, so definitely check out their website. Of course, they've got a, a hosted software as a service version that is currently free. That will probably change a self-hosted version, which is of course what we're going to look at. Uh, and then they've got an early premium version for $5 per month per user. And of course you can see all of the different things that you get associated with each of those different types of setups. Of course, there's more detail about pricing here. Um, and of course, uh, no vendor lock-in. Again, especially if you're self-hosting, uh, you don't have to keep using them. You can actually export your data and, and take it somewhere else if you ever need to do that. Um, of course, you can use their API, which means you can connect with other softwares. It is super fast, uh, no argument there. Now I will, as kind of a caveat to that, I will say that uh, when I first started setting this up, I did run into some issues uh, because of resource requirements for uh, for the Docker container to run. Uh, in fact, you know what, let's, let's cover that just here real quick, actually. Uh, so I, I, I spun this up in, uh, in uh, Proxmox, not because I had to, but because it's really just easier to spin stuff up like this and really get an idea of what's going on. So here you can see I've got two different versions of base row. Uh, this is the one that's working. And here you can see that uh, it's using about a gig of memory, uh, not using any swap space there. So, uh, so we know we've got a good amount of memory here. Basically, you want to start with about a gig. And the, the reason that I say that is when I first spun this up, uh, I was using 512 megs of memory and 512 megs of swap. And here you can see that it is basically capped out both of those. Uh, in this chart right here, we can see that it's using, you know, 438 megs of RAM. Um, and, and of course, when you start filling up the RAM, additional data has to go somewhere. That's what the swap is for. Uh, so, so if you set this up, whether it's in, you know, bare metal or, or open media vault or Synology, I had issues with Synology, but, but that just may have been on my end, or it could have been a Synology thing, who knows? If you want more details on that, I'd be happy to uh, investigate that further. But um, but yeah, so, so make sure you get a good amount of RAM, I'd say at least a gig in order for it to work effectively. Uh, when, when you start uh, running into memory and swap issues like this, where you're filling them both, things slow down dramatically and it's not a pleasant experience to use. So uh, so definitely make sure uh, two gigs may have been overboard. Uh, as you can see, I'm only using about 45% of that two gigs. Um, so definitely something to keep in mind, kind of find what fits for your needs, but just know that this is fairly memory intensive to run and keep things uh, kind of uh, perky as far as the performance is concerned. So. Uh, so we come back over to the website here. Uh, of course, they've got templates, all, all kinds of templates that we'll take a look at a little later in the video. Uh, they've got uh, a feature roadmap. Of course, this is 2021. Uh, I do hope to see this updated for 2022, um, but there you go. Uh, of course, they are, they're currently working towards version two. Um, and then of course, they've got uh, ways to e quickly and easily deploy uh, your, your, your database here. 
Um, let's see, early premium blogs. So yeah, definitely check out baseroad.io. I'll link this in the description so you can check it out. Um, but basically, uh, if we come over, if we come back up to the top, let's let's click the home button. There we go. And if we go over here to developers and we can click on uh, install with Docker, it, it, they've, they've really just made this super, super simple. So if we take a look, of course, they've got a basic quick start here uh, that we can just run in command line. Of course, that is set up on port 80 and 443. Of course, we don't want to do that. Um, you could but we're not gonna. Uh, if we scroll in a little further, of course, there are you know different environmental variables that you, you'll you wanna modify here. Uh, so if we scroll down a little further, of course, there's a ton of information here. Uh, basically, the one I ended up using was this one right here uh, to, to run it on a non-standard port. Uh, this is just what worked for me. I will say though that um, depending on how you set up your URLs, uh, this port at the end of that right there isn't necessary. Um, I'm currently setting, I've got this set up through tunnels, through Cloudflare. You could use, of course, Nginx Proxy Manager or Traffic or Caddy or whatever reverse proxy you want to if you want access to this remotely. Um, so if that's the case, you shouldn't need uh, this port 3001 or whatever you change it to. Uh, you should just be able to access it on the URL. Um, but, it, but it's very, very basic to run here. Of course, that's Docker run detached. Uh, the name is base row, the, the public URL. Again, that's how you'll access it on the internet if you want to do that. If you don't want to do that, though, and you do just want to access it locally, uh, you will want to put in HTTP, your server's IP address, and then port 3001 or whatever you change it to uh, down over here. Uh, we've got a single volume for base row data, <clears throat> uh, a restart list stopped policy, and then the current version is 1.10.1. .1. So that's really all there is to it. Of course, if you wanted to use uh, a Postgres SQL database, uh, a Redis server, email servers, they've got all of this in here. So you can kind of mix and match those to build your perfect uh, setup for whatever it is you need base row to do for you. Um, of course, they've got uh, m much more information down here. We could we could scroll for quite a while, but I think you'll you'll be able to kind of get the hang of how this works uh, here in just a moment. So if we jump over to Portainer, of course, you don't have to do this in Portainer. You could absolutely do this in command line or or whatever uh, de deployment server you like to use or setup you like to use. I actually need to uh, to stop that one. Uh, I just updated to a new version to change some stuff. I'm going to stop that one. Oh, there we go. Didn't even need it. Cool. So what we'll do is we'll come over here to stacks and it did it to me again. But basically uh, what I did uh, was I just uh, converted this um, to a docker compose uh, .yml file basically, or as they call it in Portainary stack um, and copied and pasted it in there with all my information and deployed it. Uh, basically I can show you what that, that, that uh, stack will look like. Uh, so let's do uh, composerize again, just, just because it'll be super fast. So you can kind of see what's going on here. So here we got, it just defaulted to 3.3 for the version, service, base row, container name, base row, environmental variables. Again, the public, uh, the base row public URL, uh, you will want to change that to fit your setup. Again, whether that's local or, or an actual URL, be sure to put that in there. If you try to access it differently uh, later on, like let's say you, you install it locally, but want to access it remotely later, you will need to go in and change that environmental variable in order to make it work with, uh, with a URL. So, or with a different URL, I guess is a better way to put that. Again, we've got a volume uh, for base row data, uh, port 80. Again, I changed that to 3001, restart and list stopped, image is base row slash base row. I'll put a link to this in the description as well if you want to use that uh, rather than using the command line. And then uh, if we come over to uh, Portainer, of course, here we can see that's running. And if we actually take a look at this, let's change this uh, to every one second so we can get some more real time uh, data here. Here we can see it's using almost 800 megs couple of percent on the CPU, and then not a lot on transmit and receive because we're not doing anything with it at the moment. But that's basically all there is to deploying uh, base row in a Docker container. It's super, super simple. Uh, and I really do love it uh, for that reason, if nothing else, but there's more. So uh, if we come over here, uh, this is uh, my dashboard, once I got signed in, uh, basically this Patreon, YouTube, and contacts, none of those were in there. Those are things that I added after the fact to do some testing. I was able to export CSV files from both Patreon and YouTube and Google contacts and import them via CSV into here. And it laid it out really, really nicely with no effort. So if we come over here and take a look at patrons, of course, here we can see like the name uh, of the of the patron, their Twitter, if it was provided, their Discord, if it was provided, their status, uh, their, their current pledge amount each month, uh, how long they've been a patron and when they were last charged. Now I will say that all of these came through as, um, 
a number instead of uh, actually being formatted. Uh, that's because the, the CSV that I imported didn't have uh, any of that formatting attached to it. So I had to go through and manually change these. Uh, and that's what it looked like. Of course, uh, if you want to change this, uh, that, that's how you would do it is you would go into each of the, the header lines there and do that. Of course, I want that to be a number. I don't know if there's actually currency in here. Uh, there's not. Uh, so let's go back to number. That's good enough. And you can change how many decimal places you want and whether or not you want to, uh, to allow negative numbers. That's fine. Click change. Um, but it's very, very easy to do that uh, and kind of organize things the way you'd like to see them organized. Uh, you know, you can uh, click and drag, move things around if you want to do that. Uh, so they've made that very easy. Of course, there's also hidden fields in here, uh, you know, for like, for instance, uh, you know, their their email, whether or not they follow me, their lifetime amount, their charge frequency, all of this stuff is data that was imported that I don't need. So I turned it off uh, and you can do that just by toggling switches uh, in here and you, you can see that phone turning on and off again, country on and off, but I don't, I'm not asking for that, any of that information uh, from them when they sign up to be a patron. So none of that's in here. Um, but basically you can also go to like my YouTube, uh, uh, database over here and we've got different, uh, options in here. And again, we can see date, uh, the video ID, the video title, when it was published, how many views it got on that particular day. So uh, it's very, very easy to come in here and manipulate data. You know, if I wanted to add a new column here, I could do that and I could just say, uh, demo column and then make a choice for what I want it to be in the default text would be, we'll just say like N A like that. And here we can see that it just, just added that column. So if I were to export this, this new column would be available in that uh, new export. Uh, you know, if you wanted to go to like, I'm not gonna go to contacts cause that was just a test, but if we come over here to like DB Text company and go to customers, um, you know, we've got name, last name, notes, active. You know, again, I could say, uh, we do like a uh, nickname and make a choice, single line text. Um, and I'm not gonna put anything in there, but then if I wanted to, you know, I could say Tesla if I wanted to, or, um, oops, and then I could come down here and say um, Microsoft. Of course, these are just examples again, but you kind of get the idea that it's very, very easy to manipulate this data, add new columns and rows and things like that to, to really build out a database very, very easily. And I really do love that about base row. Uh, if we wanted to, we could come up here to our dashboard. Uh, also, you should definitely, if you're interested uh, and want to support these guys, they've got, you know, uh, you can be a kind of GitHub sponsor. You can start, the, start them on GitLab. And then of course, all of their social media is up there as well. <clears throat> so if we wanted to, we could create a new uh, database and just do an empty database or we can import from Airtable. Again, that is still in beta. So it may not be 100% functional or functional at this point, but uh, we're going to call it, what's it called? A scratch for a new database uh, with no uh, with no rows or columns or anything. Uh, there it is. Oops. Don't have any tables, use the sidebar to create one, right? So then we can come in here uh, and we're just gonna call this uh, itch, why not? Uh, start with a new table. Uh, you can import a JSON file, XML, CSV. You can uh, paste da uh, table data, lots of options. We're just gonna start blank. Um, and then here we can see if I come into here, it just by default threw a couple of things in there uh, just so you've got some fields to get started with. And I love that. But what we want to do next is actually take a look um, at their templates. Uh, they've got so, so many templates in here from content management, blog post management, brand assets. Um, you know, you can you can click on each of these and see what they will look like before you import them. And I love this preview idea. Uh, there have been too many systems in the past where I had to deploy something to find out I didn't like it. And this this is amazing. I, again, I love the idea of being able to preview a template before actually deploying it. You know, you've got a wedding plan, client planner if you wanted to do that. Uh, human resources for application or applicant trackers, uh, performance reviews, um, personal professional project management, you know, project trackers. They've got a ton of different things in here. Um, and we're not going to go through all of those. I think, I think you kind of get the idea that they've got a lot of options available for, uh, for their templates that you can use as a base or getting ideas for other, uh, deployments for databases that you might want to use that sort of thing. Um, and again, yes, absolutely. Base row is, uh, sponsoring this video so that I will, um, I, I probably would have probably would have made the video without them sponsoring it at some point, but, um, but yeah, like it, it's, it's a very cool product that they've got here. 
But the way they've made it so that we can self-host these databases is, again, whether you're wanting to build something out or, or get away from something like Airtable, I, I love the idea that they made this self-hostable um, with, with, no, with no restrictions that I can see anyway. So uh, definitely check BaseRow out if you want to do that. Uh, again, links to everything in the description down below. I'll also try to remember to put um, my, uh, my Docker Compose down there that I used for my deployment. Again, there are other options for you know different database types, APIs, so many ways to integrate with this and, and really build it out to be the way you want your databases to work. So let me know in the comment section down below uh, what your thoughts are on base row and, and if this is something you would rather use uh, rather than Airtable, if you've used Airtable in the past, I'd love to get your feedback as far as uh, what base row is doing right, what they're doing wrong, that sort of thing. Uh, I think we've got a chance to, to let them know what we'd like to see in their application here. So uh, yeah, all of, all of everything will be in the description. You guys will be in the comments. And with all of that said, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up and I will talk to you guys in the next video.